Yeah, great. So um, thank you, Casey, for the introduction. So we're going to be talking today about legal structures for community-led housing. And there's, there's three sections, really. We're going to talk, start by talking about the questions that you need to ask yourself when considering what legal structure to become. And um, then we'll talk through some of the most common legal structures that there are out there. And then because I find legal theory quite boring, we'll then bring it to life a little bit by using some case studies and talking through a couple of case studies, um, which hopefully will make it feel a bit more real. And the presentation that we're going to do is based on a booklet that Wrigley have produced um, and it's, it's freely available. We don't charge for it. It's available to any community housing group that wants it. Um, if you want a copy, just email us after the event and we can send you a PDF across. Um, obviously, in current circumstances, we, we do have hard copies in the office, but we're not in the office at the moment. So PDFs are, are, the, are the best way at the moment. Um, so as, as Casey said, Wrigley's, um, we're a specialist law firm. We act for charities and social enterprises and community groups. But in this context, perhaps most importantly, we've got a, a dedicated community-led housing team. And we've been working in the sector for um, oh, over 30 years. And we also work really closely with various umbrella bodies, such as UK Co-Housing and the National CLT Network. And we, we advise CLH groups throughout England and Wales. Um, the two people who you've got with you today are myself, Laura Moss, and Sophie Henson, who's on screen as well. Um, we, we advise groups on governance and commercial matters, so it's things like setting up new groups and helping them with ongoing issues that arise from their, the rules, um, membership and board of directors and how they work, and then also on more commercial things like funding agreements and contracts with housing associations and so on. Um, I have a, a really personal interest in, in community-led housing and apologies, I'm gonna, I'll keep talking about CLH by, by which I just mean community-led housing. Um, I have a real personal interest in it because I, I sit on the board of the UK Co-Housing Trust and I have done for the last five years or so. Um, I also co-founded a community land trust in Yorkshire and I'm now in the process of developing my own co-housing community in Cumbria. So I've got lots of practical experience as well as kind of the, the core legal knowledge. Um, and I will try and I, I will try and bring that in um, where relevant because I think it just helps really to show kind of what I'm talking about sometimes. Um, so what we're going to cover today is firstly what community said housing is, and then choosing a legal structure and the questions to ask and what your, your options are. And then, like I said before, we'll then talk about some case studies. So people talk about what community you know community said housing all the time but what do we actually mean now there isn't a single legal definition of it um but these three characteristics the first three characteristics on your screen at the moment um have are the, are the, have been broadly adopted by the sector as the standard and they're included in the in in some government guidance on this on this sector um, but the government's very clear that this isn't a legal definition. So it, mean, it involves meaningful community engagement and consent throughout the whole process, right from sort of group formation through to living there. Um, the community owns, manages or stewards the homes. And then the benefits to the local areas or the community are clearly defined and legally protected. Um, I think a big question when I look at those three points is what the community is. Now, and that's what I'm going to be talking about when I talk about the what questions you ask yourself. One of the biggest questions I think you need to consider when looking at what legal structures to become is, is who is your community? Um, community-led housing as a whole, as an umbrella term, it includes things like co-housing, community land trust, housing co-ops and collective self-build. Um, however, I think what's really important is that all those four types of entity can have different underlying legal structures but don't get hung up on that because it can be completely overwhelming having all these different types of community housing to consider and all these different legal structure of, um, options. And, and that shouldn't be your starting point because it's rather than, we get groups coming to us all the time saying, I want to be a housing group or a community land trust. And, and my starting point is always to ask people to take a step back and to consider what your priorities are and what it is you're trying to achieve. So, so if I can ask you for a few minutes to completely put out of your mind legal structures and different types of community led housing, and let's just look at what you're trying to do with your housing project. So um, I'm going to try and work you through a, a whole set of questions as logically as possible. So you forget about the types of community housing and different legal structures, go back to basics and ask yourself questions in three areas, as you can see on screen. So the first is, is the people. So consider who's involved in your project and um, who benefits from the project and who controls the organisation. Um, 
I'm going to go through these in more detail in a, in a second or two, but the second lot of questions is about the, the funding, so the pounds. Where's the funding coming from? Are you, are you reliant on grant funding? Will the members be putting up the cash themselves? Um, are you going to be obtaining loans? And if so, are those loans going to be for individuals involved in the project? Or will the project itself be able to obtain a loan? And then finally, it's the property. So how should the property be owned and managed? And I think a key point here is whether you're looking at personal property ownership or collective property ownership where the legal structure owns the property rather than the individuals who live there. So over the next few slides, we're going to go through these questions in more detail. And what I what I suggest that if you, if, if you would find it useful, please make some notes to um, in response to the questions that I'm going to ask. And it, hopefully it'll help you work out what legal structure perhaps you might want to be. <clears throat> so. The first set of questions is all about the people, as I mentioned. So I think the, one of the key questions here is, is who will benefit? So who's going to live there? Is it, is it, is it, are the people who benefit from your project, the members who live in the project, or is it a benefit for the wider area? So people who live and work in the area or further afield, can they come and live in your project? And is it for their benefit? I think another way of looking at this question is, is whether you, as, as a person driving this project forward, want to build and develop or perhaps buy homes that you're gonna live in yourself, or do you want to build, develop or buy homes for other people to live in? I think linked to this is who, who's going to control the organisation. So is it just the residents who are going to control the organisation or can anyone join in um, who perhaps just live or work in the area and, and can, can they control the organisation? Um, how's that control exercised? So for example, how does voting work? Is it one vote per person, so one vote per member? Um, or is it one vote per household? Um, should the wider community have a have a a say over what happens in that in that housing development are there external entities which want a say over this project so for example we work with groups sometimes where a parish council is the driving force behind a housing development and and they want to retain some sort of control over the organization so it really isn't just the people who live in the property there's all sorts of other people who want a say in what's going on and in terms of voting control and voting balance um, how does it work in terms of finance if members are putting in money themselves do people who have put in more money want to have a louder voice in the organisation or are you happy with the principle of one member, one vote? Um, these are all quite knotty questions that can cause quite a lot of um, colourful debate at, at CLH meetings, I think, in the, especially in the early stages, but they're really important to get right, I think, from the outset. And then finally, I think perhaps most importantly, what are your aims and priorities? So are you trying to set up an intentional community with people who choose to live together and have responsibility for managing the space they live in? Or are you trying to benefit a wider area, perhaps economically, socially, environmentally, or all three? And, and of course, it could be a bit of both. You're trying to create a community, um, an intentional community, but you might be trying to improve the area at the same time. So this really comes down to the, the, your first big decision. And I would say of those three areas, the, the people, the finance and the property, these, you know, these three types of questions you have to consider, I would say people is probably the most important. Um, and, and the first big decision about the people is whether you're going to be a resident owned community or a community owned community. Um, and this comes down to this question of who is your community? Is it the people who live in the property, i.e. the residents? And that was, that's what I would call closed membership. Um, housing cooperatives tend to be resident owned communities and most co-housing groups are also um, resident owned communities. Um, alternatively, are members from the wider community, so people who live and work in an area, able to join in and control the, the organisation? And that's what I would think of as, as open membership rather than closed membership. And community land trusts are, are perhaps the best example in the sector of, of open membership organisations because they have to have an open membership under the legal definition of, of um, community land trusts. I mean, there's benefits and drawbacks to each. Um, it comes down really to control. So it's whether residents want to control their own environment or whether the development's in the wider interests of the, of the community. Um, it, it might also affect funding though in some cases. So community owned structures might find it easier to attract funding because there's clear evidence of this wider public benefit, um, especially where they're being used to deliver affordable housing. Um, we'll talk a bit, a bit more about that when we come on to charitable status, this idea of sort of private benefit and public benefit. 
um, there are some hybrid models out there, which I think perhaps we don't need to go into today, but we're working with one group in particular in Yorkshire where there's a community owned structure, which is leasing homes to a resident owned structure. So you've ended up with both side by side um, and it, it can be really useful in the right circumstances, but they are quite complex and you end up with multiple legal entities and working out how the funding works between the two organisations and so on and so forth isn't always the easiest, but it, it can be a really useful thing to know about. So the second lot of questions is, is about the funding, about the pounds. So I think considering where the funding is coming from is, is quite a useful um, exercise to go through. So if, if you're going to be reliant on grant funding, then you may well need an asset lock of some sort in your legal structure. And Sophie will talk a bit about what different types of asset lock there are. Um, if you're going to be looking at community finance, so raising money from your local community, either by issuing shares or bonds, um, it's, it's a really tightly regulated area that, but there are certain legal structures that benefit from exemptions in the legislation. Um, if you're going to do a community share issue or a community bond issue, then you need the, like, the right legal structure in place at the outset. And you know, we know lots of community-led housing groups who've, all, who've raised oh, hundreds of thousands of pounds this way. So it can be a really useful source of finance, but it, it really does affect what legal structure you might become. Um, I think if you're another another source of finance very common in particular co-housing and cooperatives is is funding from individuals. So people involved in the organisation might lend it money, or they might buy into the scheme, perhaps by um, purchasing a market value property, which cross subsidises some of the other properties within the development. Um, loans, you know, there are, there's some specialist CLH lenders out there, people like Ecology and Triodos and Charity Bank. Um, you might also get loans from local authorities. Um, I think what I would say here in the context of legal structures is that not all lenders are comfortable with very unusual or bespoke um, or novel legal structures. So, for example, um, we know of some, some lenders where they wouldn't touch something like a shared equity scheme um, or very wild and wacky um, legal structures that no one's ever tested before so it's just kind of being aware that your legal structure might affect what loan finance you can get if you're trying to get mainstream um, lenders on board and then finally i've said in kind support because you can't really underestimate how much you might be able to wangle for free you know there's lots of clh groups out there that have managed to get um huge discounts on interesting building techniques and um, lilac and leeds is one where they they built their houses using um straw fill panels and they got a huge discount on those panels because I think it was the first project in the UK to have used them so um, it's, a, it's a useful uh, one to go after which might not necessarily affect your legal structure but it's something to consider anyway. I think what I would say in relation to the money though is, is don't let the funding lead you. It is really important but you shouldn't let the finance and the source of finance determine what legal structure you want to be. Um, it's sort of the wrong, to me it's the wrong way around because trying to mould yourself just to meet funders requirements might not necessarily enable you to meet your priorities and your objectives in the way you'd like to. And then finally, um, the third set of questions, we've done people, we've done pounds and is now property. So. Um, how, how should the property be owned? And I guess the biggest question here is whether you're looking at personal property ownership where residents own uh, their own freehold or a long leasehold of an individual unit, which they can perhaps sell and then recoup the value of when they move on. Um, alternatively, it, is, is the property going to be held as common ownership? So where the legal structure itself owns all the properties and individuals just pay rent to live there and you know, on, on the basis of say, a short term lease individuals wouldn't usually build up any capital in the property in that context and the legal structure itself would be taking out any loans and, and um, granting the mortgage to a lender. Um, you might also have a legal structure which retains an ownership stake, so something like shared ownership where, where the legal structure actually retains the stake in the ownership of the, of the property um, and that might be to ensure it's got control over them in the long term, you know, to ensure perpetual affordability. And then finally, are you providing affordable housing? Um, you know, that might be social rent or affordable rent or something like shared ownership. And if you are, I think the biggest question is how is that going to be financed? And that comes back to the question of are you going to be reliant on grant funding for that? Um, it can be really difficult if, you're, if you've not got grant funding to manage to um, afford to deliver affordable housing as part of a, a housing project. And it might mean that you have to work in partnership with a third party, such as a housing association. And if that's the case, then do those third parties have any requirements over what your legal structure needs to look like? In some cases, they might only work with you if you have a particular model. 
Um, so it's worth having those conversations at an early stage to kind of explore what their requirements are. So, so that's all the questions really that you, you have kind of tried to whistle stop tour, um, talk you through. Um, Sophie's now going to talk about what the different options are in terms of legal structures. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Thanks for running through all those questions. I'm sure that's given everyone lots to think about. Um, so once you have the answers to Laura's questions, once you spent some time thinking about those, um, you can then start thinking about which legal structure is right for you. Um, so as the slide says, I'm going to run through um, the common legal structures available to community-led housing groups, um, the optional wrappers that go around those structures, um, and some changes that you may want to make to customise your constitution. Um, so if we just move on to the next slide, um, which is choosing a basic legal structure. Um, there are three legal structures that we find most suitable for community-led housing groups. Um, and these are the company um, and the two types of registered society. So the Community Benefit Society and the Cooperative Society. And all three of those structures have separate legal identity. So um, in the law, the identity is seen as a separate person from its members and directors. So it can do things like hold property and enter into contracts into its own name. All three also have limited liability for their directors and members. Um, and that's quite important as it gives them protection if the entity goes into liquidation or if any other claims are made against it. Um, and I've just mentioned members and directors there. The, the difference between the two is quite important. Um, you can think of members sort of like the owners of an organisation. Um, so they're generally responsible for the overarching or big picture decisions um, that need to be taken like appointing directors um, or changing the constitution. Whereas directors are responsible for the ordinary day-to-day -day business of the organisation. So that's approving legal documents um, and reviewing the annual accounts, that sort of thing. Um, so when you're looking through the questions that Laura's just run through, the key one to think about here is whether your entity will be resident or community owned. Um, a company could be either. Community Benefit Society will always be community owned and a cooperative society will be resident owned in this community led housing context. And there's some other key differences between the three structures and these include the legislation that they're governed by and their regulators, which is Companies House for Companies and the FCA for Societies. Um, societies no longer have to pay an annual fee to the FCA, which makes things a little bit cheaper than it used to be, but they can still be more expensive to register than companies. Um, there's also less flexibility in what you can include in their constitutions compared to the articles of companies. But we find that the society, whether that's cooperative or community benefit, is a really popular choice for many um, community-led housing groups. Um, for the reason that Laura said, that they benefit from exemptions to the usual rules about making share and bond offers. Um, so they have a really uh, a good way to raise finance from the community that's not available to other legal structures. Um, so just moving on now to the optional extras or wrappers that can go around your legal structure. Um, so this, this is the next question to ask yourself. Once you've got the legal structure, um, you've decided on that, um, is which optional extra to put around your legal entity, if any. Um, so the three wrappers that we find um, are most um, helpful for community-led housing groups are the non-charitable asset lock charitable status and the community land trust. Um, so I'm just going to run through these on the next few slides. I'm starting with the non-charitable asset lock. So if you are a charity, you'll have, you'll have a, a, an asset lock. This is a different kind of asset lock, a non-charitable asset lock. Um, and asset locks are used to protect an organization's property by ensuring that it can only ever be used for the organization's object and it can never be sold in, um, for private gain. Um, so this means that if you do have one, um, it will limit what you can do with your assets to some extent. Um, but they can be really important for grant funding. Um, for example, National CLT Network requires one, um, and so do many councils for community-led housing money. Non-charitable asset locks are only available to companies and community benefit societies. And if you are a company and want to have an asset lock, you need to become a community interest company or KIP or CIC. They're, they're known by many names. Um, asset locks are really unlikely to be used for resident-owned structures like cooperative societies um, because it mean, they mean that the assets would be preserved um, for the wider community rather than being divided up 
between the members if the entity was to be dissolved. And so that means that the members wouldn't be able to get out their share of the property. Um, and then the next, next one I'm going to cover is charitable status. Um, so there's two tests that you, that you need to fulfil to become a charity. The first is having a charitable purpose, as you can see on the slide. Um, but housing on its own is not a charitable purpose. So um, the housing would need to relieve a charitable need in order to be considered charitable. And, and that could be poverty, old age or sickness. If your group's going to be providing affordable housing, this will need really careful analysis. Um, and you'll need to look at local wages compared to local housing costs um, and take into account the type and cost of housing that you're going to be offering um, and, and weigh this all up to decide whether you meet that test. Um, and the second test to, that you'll need to fulfill to be a charity is existing for the public benefit, as Laura touched on. Um, so resident owned structures are really unlikely to qualify for this because um, there's too much private benefit there to their members. Um, so if you're thinking of becoming a charity, your legal entity will need to be community owned. Um, so that could be a community benefit society or a company with an open membership. Um, and this is a really technical area of law. And if you are considering becoming a charity, it would probably be worth um, going out and getting some advice um, to help you make your decision. Um, it's also worth noting that charitable companies are required to register with the Charity Commission, but charitable CBSs and community benefit societies are exempt. So why would you, why would you consider becoming a charity? Well, there's substantial tax benefits, and that's the main advantage. Um, so there's, they've got tax relief on profits, um, business rates relief, and tax relief on donations. Also, SDLT relief, which can be really useful. Um, but these benefits do come at the cost of extra regulation and limits to what you can do, what activities your group can do, um, because everything must be charitable and must fit within a charitable purpose. So it is something that needs quite a lot of thought before you go ahead. Um, and then the final wrapper that I'm going to touch on today is um, CLT status or community land trust status. So CLTs provide homes for their communities that are genuinely affordable now and into the future. In order to be a community land trust, um, your organisation will need to further the social, economic and environmental interests of the local community. Laura mentioned that wording too, and it, it comes from statute. Um, the membership of CLTs must be open to the local community and they must be controlled by their members. Um, they're also non-profit distributing, so any profits must be used to benefit the local community and can't be distributed to the members. There's also no national register of CLTs, you simply become one if you meet that statutory definition and there's no need to register anywhere. And we find that the CLT wrapper is a really popular um, option for groups that are delivering affordable housing um, or other projects that have clear community benefit. If you do decide to become one, um, you can choose to join the National CLT Network to access their member benefits and resources, which can be really helpful. And then the final thing to think about, and I know we're giving you, giving you so many things to think about today, is whether to customise your constitution. Um, so which legal structure you choose will affect the extent to which you can do this. Um, company, it's much easier to customise the articles of a company than the constitution of a society. On the slide there, um, we've listed some things to think about um, when thinking about whether to customise your constitution. And these include whether there's any stakeholders that want representation. So this could be by giving them the right to appoint a director, for example. Um, you'll also want to think about voting rights. So would it be one member, one vote, or weighted voting, or one vote per household, like Laura mentioned? Um, and finally, how will you make decisions? So will it be by majority or consensus or something else? Um, and that's everything that I'm covering today. So I'm going to pass back to Laura, who's going to run you through some case studies to explain how all of this works in practice. Thank you, Sophie. So, I mean, hopefully you've got a sense there of the variety of legal structures that are open to you. Um, there are a couple of legal structures that we haven't touched on at all because, and the, the reason really is that we just wouldn't necessarily recommend them for community-led housing groups. One is company limited by shares. We do know of one or two um, CLH groups who've, who've gone down the share company route, but 
in general it's not appropriate because it, they're, they tend to be for profit making entities and CLH isn't usually about profit, profit generation and um, there are other more technical reasons um, we wouldn't always recommend them as well um, in this context which um, we have not time to go into today and then, he, and then the second thing really is, is mention, to mention is that we wouldn't necessarily recommend you go down sort of an unincorporated structure all these structures we're talking about are incorporated entities so um you know there's lots of things out there like unincorporated associations or partnerships and um, but you just don't get the protection of limited liability with those so um so we've kind of narrowed it down to uh criminal by guarantee or some type of society so in terms of case studies the first which i wanted to talk about is home house farm so this is my own co-housing community so it makes it very easy for me to be able to talk about and um, this is we, we've bought some land just outside kendall in south cumbria so it's a very rural area at the moment it's a load of derelict farm buildings and as you can see it's a bit of a mess um, i don't know if you can see that on the photograph there's um, a lot of symbols all around the site where it's an a with a circle around which i've since learned means anarchy so you can get a sense of the people who used to live there. Um, it was squatted for, for decades by um, a, a group of people who wanted to kind of create this idealistic community in the south of Cumbria where property prices are very expensive, but they didn't get planning permission and the local council hated them. So, and after years and years and years of legal wrangling, they were kicked off the land and the, and the owner of the land sold it to eventually to us. Um, but it means that the site's got this colourful history and it's a bit of a state. Um, hopefully we'll be able to carry on some of the ethos with what we're doing but um but we're still having issues with planning so who knows um anyway so we're, we're planning on knocking down all the existing buildings and replacing them with um eco new build homes and we'll try and reuse as much of the material as we can to try and keep it as, as eco as possible um, but going back to the questions that i talked about at the beginning of the presentation i mean i could talk for hours about what we're doing on the site but if you want to know about legal structures so our, our priorities, in terms of the people involved, our priority is to create an intentional community of, of like-minded people who want to build um, sustainable homes and live according to eco-friendly principles where we try and share as many resources as possible. Um, we are trying to benefit the wider area, so we're engaging with the local community as much as we can and we're doing things like planting a community orchard, um, but you, there's no doubt really that the biggest benefit will be to the people who live there, you know, it's, it's going to be to us. And one of the reasons for that is that we want to be a resident owned community, we want to have control over the houses that we build. Um, you know we are outward facing and we've held lots of community engagement events but we don't want anyone else to control the homes that we live in they're going to be owner occupied and um, some of the households involved want to have um, i've only got one person in and um, whereas others are whole families but we want to make sure that every household has an equal say so that's quite keen we, we, it's quite important to us that it isn't just one member one vote it's it's one vote per household rather than per person um, so we need quite a lot of flexibility in our constitution to permit that. We usually use consensus decision making, but occasionally things do have to go to a vote. And in terms of the, the pounds, the finance, the money's come in largely from residents and bank loans, but we have had some grant funding from the Community Housing Fund. And then with in terms of the property, like I said, we want relatively conventional property ownership where we, we all own our own property um, and we've got the ability to sell up and move on or to leave the property in a will to somebody else. A couple of our households are a bit older and you know they, they're thinking about these questions now really, if, um, when eventually they, they pass on, who can they leave this property to? Um, we also want to make sure that every resident on the site is a member of the legal structure um, to make sure that everybody is fully engaged with the uh, environment in which we live and involved in, in the running of it. Um, the, the kind of the way the property has been set up is that the, the legal structure is going to own the whole site and then individuals, individual households will own their own freehold of their own properties, but then each person who lives in one of those properties is a member of the legal structure which owns the common areas so we share responsibility for the common areas um, and that's a really really common way for co-housing entities to operate um, Lancaster on the brink Cannock Mill Marmalade Lane most co-housing groups I know of operate in quite a similar way to us um, so in terms of the legal structure we ended up choosing it was it was for me it was a bit of an obvious choice really and we've, we've gone down the uh, uh, limited by guarantee route the reason being that it's really simple and it's really flexible so we could put things in about quirky voting rights per household rather than one member one vote and it can also evolve over time as the community beds in so we've not had to make changes to the constitution yet but i can see in the future we might have to as as things change and as um as things evolve 
in terms of the the optional wrappers we actually didn't need any um, we are mainly self-funding we don't want to be tied into any funders requirements being a clt wasn't appropriate because we're a resident owned structure um charitable status there's too much private benefit involved so we wouldn't qualify for that so so we've ended up with just a, a simple very simple basic clg structure um, however, the third step that Sophie talked about, customising the constitution, we did do quite a lot of customisation. So to put in those weighted voting rights per household and to make sure that consensus decision making is built into the, the articles as well. And um, we've also got um, an acknowledgement about the wider community benefit that we hope to bring to the area in the objects as well, because I think that's quite important to have enshrined in our constitution. In contrast to Home House Farm is um, Knaresborough CLT, Knaresborough Community Land Trust. Now this is um, a group that we worked with a couple of years ago and they're, they're based up in, in Yorkshire. Knaresborough is a really beautiful market town but it's quite touristy in, in Yorkshire as you can see it's very pretty. Um, they approached us, it was the, the, the local mayor at the time and a woman who had been very involved in the third sector in Knaresborough approached us because they were concerned about um, affordable housing in the local area. Well, they were just basically there wasn't very much affordable housing in the local area. And um, people, because it's very tourist heavy, there aren't many other job opportunities in the area. So they wanted to do something that created jobs in the area for local people and also provided people um, doing those jobs with a place to live. Um, so they were keen to benefit local people in general and the, the control, going back to that question about who should control this organisation, it was very much community control. So the local council was a driving force, but it didn't want, they didn't want it to be a council project. They wanted it to be a project that was, that was run and operated by local people for local people. Um, in terms of where the finance was coming from, they are very much reliant on grant funding, but they also might do a community share issue in the future because um, there is quite a lot of money around that area of North Yorkshire and people are quite invested in, in some of these sort of local projects that go on. So they, they think they, they should be able to raise quite a bit of money through a community share issue at some point in the future. And then, and then finally, the third question of people pounds property. Property, the idea is that the properties that are built by the CLT will be collectively owned by the legal structure and then they'll most likely be rented out to, to people who live in them. Um, that might be done through a housing association, they're not quite sure yet. So in terms of the basic legal structure then, they, they wanted to be a community owned structure that was very outward facing and they want to do lots of community engagement and they might want to do a community share issue. So they, a community benefit society is the natural choice for them and community benefit society, the starting point is always that you have one member, one vote. Well, that works for them. That's actually pretty, pretty good for them. It means that regardless of how much people have put into the society, financially or otherwise, um, they only have, have one vote each. So it's quite a democratic, equal, equal structure. And I would say, I mean, it's in the name. It's quite obvious that they're a community land trust in terms of what optional wrappers they chose. Um, I think I've seen somewhere recently that something like 80% of CLTs choose to become a community benefit society as their legal structure. So it's a really common, common option for a CLT. So the basic structure of this, a CBS, a community benefit society, in terms of the optional wrappers, they chose to comply with the CLT definition because it, it fits their aims and objectives really neatly. They're all about bringing social, economic and environmental benefits to an area. Um, they want any assets owned by the CLT to be owned for the benefit of the community in the long term um, and they want to be a non-profit entity. They chose not to adopt charitable status because they wanted to ensure maximum flexibility. So they weren't quite sure at the outset whether or not they were going to be able to do just affordable housing, whether they'd have to do some market housing as well. Um, they were looking at um, questions around employability and the provision of workspace. And in some cases that can be charitable, but they just weren't that sure. They weren't able to commit at that stage to saying, well, everything, you know, once you're charitable, you're always charitable. And um, <clears throat> they wanted to retain flexibility to do things which may or may not be charitable in the future. I mean I would say it's, it's fairly common for charities to have trading subsidiaries and the trading subsidiary can do the non-charitable aspects of what the you know, things that the charity itself can't do um, but then it adds a, that adds another level of complication and an, another legal structure to the mix which for a small volunteer board might be a bit, a bit much to ask for. And um, they do however have a non-charitable asset lock in their rules not least because this was important to funders, but also because <clears throat> they want to make sure that it's for the benefit of the community in the long term and that the future members can't just divide up the assets between them. They want to make sure that any assets in the, owned by the society 
re remain for the community benefit in the long term. Um, and then finally, in terms of the third stage, customising their rules, they, they didn't need to have very many amendments to the model rules that we used for them. Um, some community land trusts we've worked with have council representation on the board, so representatives from a local parish or town council actually sitting on the board or sometimes with the right to appoint directors to the board. Um, in their case, the, the mayor didn't, he wasn't interested in that, they, he just wanted to be completely community, community owned. Um, it's perhaps slightly more detailed than you need at the moment, but um, once you've got a non-charitable a non asset lock in your rules, you can't then become a charity. So it did mean, by having that non-charitable asset lock in the rules, it meant they were ruling out the option of perhaps coming a becoming a charitable CBS in the future without setting up a new society and transferring everything across to it. So my starting point with all of this is always to keep it as simple as you can, but if you're choosing, if you're a community benefit society and you're having to choose what asset lock you, you're going to have, a non-charitable asset lock or a charitable asset lock, there is, it, is, it does make quite a big difference actually because if, you're non, if you've got a non-charitable asset lock, converting to a charity further down the line isn't impossible but it's, it requires quite a few steps to go through and we, we, we work, we're working with a group at the moment who's going through that um, but it isn't, it isn't always that straightforward so just a, a note of caution on that one. And um, that's it from our, us in terms of the core presentation, but we are more than happy to take questions if you've got any. I think Casey and Alan are going to chair that, I think. Yes, fab. Thanks both. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, Laura, and then uh, we can all see each other. But I think we've had a question I've just seen on the chat uh, from Alison, uh, Alison Ward. Uh, so what would your advice be to a group that were only considering a charitable status charitable say just to avoid paying corporation tax would you say it was worth it are they, are they going to be trading it's corporation tax only arrives on trading profits so clh groups don't don't tend to do much trading um on uh, rental income from ground rents so i wouldn't say it was a massive amount but i suppose looking at how much tax when was it, when we, we can't advise on tax, but looking at how much tax it would entail, the corporation tax isn't usually the driver in this sector. It's usually things like SDLT on the when you we you know in the tax you pay when you buy a property up front. Um, yeah, it, it really it really depends it really depends on whether they're whether they're up for the constraints that charitable status brings, um, and whether what they're doing ultimately the, the bigger question really is whether what they were doing would qualify for charitable status. Ah, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, please feel free to post them in the chat um, or put your hand up or um, unmute yourself. Or well, have we got a quiet group today? <laughs> or maybe two, you've probably given them too much, too much to think about and they're all writing notes frantically. I can ask a question about um, when it might be most appropriate to use the society structure. Yes, Sophie, do you want to? Um, oh, as opposed to a company? Exactly. Um, um, I suppose um, we find, well, uh, CLTs, as Laura mentioned, are often community benefit societies. They, 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 there's clear community benefit um, for a um, community benefit society. So I think that's, that's a natural fit. If you're going to be doing a community own structure and there's going to be clear community benefit um, having that community benefit society label can be helpful um, and um, cooperative societies um, I suppose it's um, it, it's really down to what what the what the organization is going to be doing Laura do you want to add add anything about cooperative societies um, I guess I guess for me um, the, the biggest advantage of a, of a society is the ability to do a community share offer or community bond offer without having to comply with all those onerous requirements around um, FISMA is the, is the Act, Financial Services and Markets Act. And it means that when you, you know, when you see a, a share offer on the news and it, and it, or on, the, on an advert and it has loads of caveats underneath saying your investment may rise or fall, it has to be a, a prospectus like that has to be approved by an authorised person. It's very expensive to do. 
if you're a society you're exempt from all those requirements I mean, you, you might fulfill some of them just because of best practice um but it means it means it's much cheaper to do a community share offer or a community bond offer and um, i think so that's that's definitely the biggest advantage the biggest disadvantage to me is the lack of flexibility around it so um you have to you register with the financial conduct authority and you have to meet their requirements and so a big one which i mentioned with home house farm is the starting point is always whether you're a co-op or a cbs and um, one member one vote and if that doesn't fit with you then it, it's really hard to use a society structure um yeah and, and if you want to amend the constitution down the line down the line as well i suppose um societies you need to go to the fca and get their consent every time and um, so if you think it will be something that will be involving then a company may be better because it's much easier to amend the articles later down the line. Uh, I think we've got another question from Alison as well in the chat. Um, so are you able to tell us about the legal structure options for mutual home ownership? Definitely. It's one of my favourite favorite topics. <laughs> um, mutual home ownership is a really um, a niche, very niche type of structure. Um, there's only one in existence at the moment that's, that's officially an MHOS, um, which is Lilac in Leeds. There is another one that we're working on that's going to be based in York. Um, they are um the underlying legal structure is a cooperative society and the idea of an mhos is that the cooperative society owns all the properties and has a mortgage a collective mortgage from the bank or from whoever and um, people live in those properties on the basis of a short-term lease and they pay a monthly charge to live there but in return for that monthly charge they build up an equity pot a pot of funding within the society which when they leave they can take with them so it's kind of halfway between property ownership and just renting. So, you know, conventional renting, you pay rent to your landlord and when you leave, you get nothing back. But in an MHOS structure, you, you do get to take something with you when you go. Um, if, if you're interested in an MHOS, it is, um, there's a really helpful short briefing paper which Paul Chatterton, who is the founder of Lilac, has written and I think it's available on their website. Um, he also wrote a book, but if you, if you want, the, the book's excellent, but it's it's a whole book, but if you want a short taster of how MHOS works, then I would recommend that briefing paper. There's also some articles, we've, we've written a couple of articles on our website about it as well, because because um, we're engaged with the York group in we're slightly simplifying the model for the York group because Lilac has lots of bells and whistles on it um, for example, when you, the money that you put in is a third of your income every month. Um, so every month you pay a third of your income to the society. And when you leave, the value of the of the funding pot that you've built up is any, any it, it can increase in line with local wages. Um, so we're trying to strip some of that out to make it a bit simpler in the new, in the new one. There's five households um, involved in my scheme and we started off with just four of us and um, the fifth one joined in later. In, in our case, all the adults involved are members and directors of the company. Um, so it just, it just meant that when the new people joined, they also became members and directors and we added them on a company's house as directors. Um, I think a tricky, uh, something that you do need to work out is the funding, um, you know, the financial model of how, how that will work if you guys are putting up the funding up front to buy this and others are gonna buy in later they're buying it from the company rather than from you guys as individuals so what happens to that money then that's in the company um if you've got if the company's had to borrow money to buy the site then it can be used to repay the lenders um but it can be it's just a case of working that out so in our case um we actually by the time we by the time we came around it took ages and ages and ages to buy the by the site so by the time it came to the purchase we actually had all our members of the company but the plan had been that um, we all have loan agreements between us as individuals and the company. So if, if only four households had had to put up the money to buy the site, um, it would have been, we would have each put in a quarter of the purchase price and the loan agreement would have reflected that between us and the company. And then when a new person came in, their money would have been used to repay us all a bit of our capital. So it would have kind of, does that make sense? It kind of would have then come out in the wash. But as it happened, all, we all, all five of us have just put, pulled our money and we bought it between us. We've still got loan agreements, um, which mainly are to cover our backs in case someone decides to leave. Um, we've, I've seen that happen with co-housing groups in the past where um, people have put money in and they've all bought a site together and then 
um, someone's left and there's been a bit of a bun fight over how they get the money out and what they've put in and whether you count their sweat equity as in the time and the labour they've put in and so on and so forth. So having it, because I'm a risk averse lawyer, having it clearly documented was quite important to me. I think, you know, we, we, we approach things from a legal perspective, but people I talk to, like Alison, in fact, who's now gone, and, and Casey and Alan, um, who are adv CLH advisors, um, they, everyone seems to take a similar approach to we take in terms of like, think about your, your, the people involved yeah. and your priorities and your objectives and so on, and try and get that plan clear before you then go down the road of setting up a legal structure. Um, I think Casey and I have talked about that before, haven't we, about how that how important it is really. So, um, but but plenty of groups come to us with a constitution. Sometimes it's it's it really is back of a fag packet constitution. It's just sort of some principles that they want to govern their organisation, and that's actually quite helpful sometimes to help us see what people are trying to achieve and what they what they're aiming at. Um, before you spend money on lawyers in particular um getting a clear idea of of what you want is is really helpful because then you you don't the less chance of you changing your mind and wasting your money